Okay. Um, I'm. This is this is the teacher talk about girls. I'm on on late. Um, but I'm only late because of I'm a teacher. I can do these whenever I want. <laughs> um, I'm I like the I like it for there to be more comments before I do the videos. That's why I was waiting, because there weren't many comments on girls. There still aren't, still nearly nine. I like there to be at least ten if we're gonna if we're doing this. Um you know the input from you is as important as the input from me, so I like to I like to accumulate more comments before I do the videos. Um, but, um, I'll talk, I'll talk to you about girls, the TV show. Um, it's, I, I mean, it's sex in the city. I think I put this in the, this, in the title, right? It's the sex in the city for millennials, I guess. And I don't, like, that's dumb. That was a stupid thing to say, but. It kind of is, um, and I don't even know what a millennial is, like the, the definitive uh, time period. Um, but it's just you know what I mean when I say that. When I say that, so the as I mentioned in the description, like Lena Dunham, the show was a was a hit. Like that first season was like, and people were like, "Oh shit, who is this Lena Dunham?" And she kind of skyrocketed to fame as a result, you know. Um, and as this show progressed, she started to take a lot of shit about representation and um, things that a lot of you mentioned in your your comments. Stuff that people were like, with any good show, there's going to be criticisms. How do you deal with those? Right? Are you open? And uh, you know, the mark of any good show, I think, is its own self-awareness and understanding its place and the power that it can have. Right? And I feel like Sex in the City again. If you have to be following along um, with these ideas, that you know, my theory about. Sex in the City being the ultimate male sort of exploitation of feminism to benefit men. Um, if that's the case, I feel like this, in many ways, was taking, at least in the televisual landscape, taking feminism back from it being exploited by men for the most part. Right, sex in the city, fucking and shopping. Like, well, who benefits most from a, a culture that thinks that's what feminism is? Mostly white dudes, right? Capitalist capitalism, like shop, shop therapy, keep shopping, keep, you know, keep lining our pockets and keep having sex with us. Like, the um so if anything girls is like whoa we need to reclaim this we need to take this back and there's always going to be criticisms um I, but i think she works to address them um and uh within the show as it progresses so you know we watched the pilot episode and you know the pilot episode is just full of uh, intertextuality and things that you know, are full of goodies for, for, for us to talk about. So first, the show recognizes its place, sort of, and I, 
I think that this is part of it too, like taking feminism back from the patriarchy in many ways. It acknowledges its connection to all the a bunch of different you know, feminist texts that came before it in in entertainment. Um, mentions Clueless. It mentions um, Mary Tyler Moore. They fell asleep. Melanie and uh, Hannah fell asleep watching Mary Tyler Moore. And <clears throat> uh, obviously Sex in the City. That scene with Shoshana and Jessa in Shoshana's apartment with the poster is so good and so necessary for, I think, again, reclaiming it. Like, this was feminism for, you know, 15 years, the mid 90s to the mid to the, to the, you know, to the mid 2000s, you know. This was Sex and the City had sort of defined feminism for a culture. Good or bad, I don't, you know, that's sort of part of the discussion. So to have them parody it in such a way with Shoshana ex explaining to Jessa, Jessa has no idea what it is, right? She's so cool and aloof. She doesn't even know what the show is. And Shoshana is beholden to those rigid classifications that Sex and the City likes to impose onto women, right? I'm a kid, I, my, my Samantha comes out, but I'm a Charlotte and I'm a kid. You are this with, with, with Charlotte hair. Like, that's how Shoshana sees the world, is through this lens of Sex and the City. And it shapes her identity to that extent that she, you know, it's something for her to talk about with Jessa. And Jessa's like, no idea. I don't know. I don't know what that is. I'm not on Facebook. And, you know, Shosh, Shosh thinks that's classy. You're so classy. Um, so that right there is a criticism of that sex in the city feminism. And it's take, and again, the show, the rest of that episode is like a reclaiming of the cultural perception of what it means to be feminist and to be a woman and things like that. Um, and that reclaiming is going to be more authentic. It's going to be it's going to be uglier, it's going to be darker, it's going to be more realistic. I think that was the goal of it, was if Sex in the City was this fantasy land, right, loud and bubbly and bright colors and, you know, fucking and shopping, this is going to be, let's not do that. Right, that contributes to uh, a feminist zeitgeist that we don't that we don't want to perpetuate. Um, and I, I think the show, if you're looking at it, if that's the standard, if that's what the show is going for, and you know, only Lena Dunham really knows that. Um, then I think they succeeded, right? Very successful. Um, so the show acknowledges its connection to all these shows and all these TV women or women in entertainment media that came before it. Um, so Hannah, you know, Hannah's obviously the main character and she is you know, she's entitled, right? She's, her parents are, have money and they're successful. And she is, she's sort of coasting on her entitlement alone, right? Um, 
the whole scene at the at dinner, the opening scene at dinner with her parents, and she's like, "I'm doing you you a fate, like you owe me money because I'm not a drug addict, right? Like that whole mentality um, is is just. I mean, I I'm thinking about my childhood and growing up, like you know, like no. You wouldn't. You wouldn't even think to say something like that. Um, that's all rolled into this sense of entitlement that I, I don't want to cast too wide a net over you, you guys, your generation, and well, I don't even know what generation you guys are, but you're one of them. Um, but that's uh, my kids are your. I have a son your age, and he, you know he's a he's a piece of shit too. So, like, in that way, it's just a way of thinking, and it's you're almost powerless to stop it because it's the way you've always you've been conditioned to see the world that it fucking owes you something. Um, and it doesn't like that's what Hannah quickly finds out. Um, so I think her character is supposed to be, is supposed to be that sort of cloying, entitled white girl, and she gets her ass kicked. Like, that's, if you watch the show, she repeatedly gets her ass kicked by, you know, by all of this, by all of this kind of stuff. Her job, her parents, her relationships, her friendships, she gets her ass kicked, and it's like, yeah. That's that's how it is. Like, doesn't matter how much, how special you think you are, or how many times your parents said you could be anything you want to be. The world is the world doesn't give a shit about you. <laughs> I guess. Um, that took a turn there for a second. I'm gonna steer it back now. Um, Shoshana isn't in this episode a ton. She's like she's one of my favorite characters. She's only in that Sex in the City scene with Jessa, but she's a she's a principal character. So the four girls of girls are Marnie and Hannah and Shoshana and Jessa. Um so a lot of you in your comments acknowledged the diff just the difference in tone. I think Leo mentioned tone. Um and it's just, it's, it's down, it's, it's not as loud, it's not as bright, it's not as sort of uh, glamorized, it's not, in no way is it promoting this lifestyle for anybody, right? It's not trying to, to make it look like uh, this fantasy world. Um, it wants to be gritty. It wants to be dark. Just, just in even in from a production standpoint, if you think about Sex and the City, it's like, oh man, it's just like wham, you're hit with fucking color and noise and and tits, right? And Girls is like understated. It's darker. It's it's slower moving. It's um, all of these things and the none of it is none of that is represented more distinctly than the sex <coughs> right it's always it's always interesting to me to watch that sex scene with Kylo Ren and, and Hannah in that apartment with a room full of people um, because it's, it's awkward. It's supposed to be awkward. And I said this in class. Like, we've all presumably had sex. Okay? It's more often than not, it's like that. There's It's awkward. There aren't fireworks going off. Your hair's not perfect. You're, you know, it's with a guy or a girl that you're like, yeah, I don't really, I mean, 
how many times is the sex that you have like sex in the city where it's like fucking transcendent like fuck like three percent i don't even i mean so it's like no i want this to be authentic i want it to be real like this is what's interesting about it is that this is most people's experience with any of any of a number of things um and what that does is, I think that allows uh, passage into a space where you can have more interesting discussions, right? Like that sex scene, as awkward as it is, and, you know, some of you are sort of judgy about, oh, well, she, you know, she was trying to please a man and all that stuff. I, I think that stuff's irrelevant and surfacey when you really think about it when it leads into this discussion about body image and how she feels about her body and her weight and trying to control that with tattoos and things like that. And that's much more compelling than, you know, oh my God, the sex was amazing. And like, just stop, dude. Um, so they made a conscious effort to depict things as sort of as stripped down, no pun intended, as stripped down and to the bone, no pun intended, um, <laughs> as possible. And like I said, I think what happens as a result of that, you know, stripping away of the facade of it all and the entertainment of the all the glamour of it all is you get to more compelling conversations and ideas as a result i think that was something that the show tried to tried to embrace and did embrace um <laughs> she says to her parents at the dinner where they they cut her off, the opening scene, the dinner where they cut her off. She says, I'm busy trying to become who I am. Right? And I, I always laugh at that because, again, this generational thing. Like, there was no, like, that wasn't even a thing. It wasn't even a sentiment. Like, when I was growing up, it was, you're going to finish high school, or college. I was the first generation to really where college was expected. You were expected to go to high school, go to college after high school. Like that was my generation was the first Gen X in the mid, early to mid nineties. Like before that, it was like, you know, so I didn't hear all this about chase your, there was no chase your dreams. There was no, you can be whatever you want to be. There was no, none of that like hokey bullshit that kids are raised on these days there was no find out who you are i had to fucking just do that on the fly there was no like take time to find out who you are you know so i always laugh i'm busy trying to become who i am right uh, <laughs> this is too funny but i think overall the show tries not to sugarcoat the plight but recognizes women's own role in the plight of equality and, and feminism and all those kinds of things, right? I, yeah, you know, I, I think they do a pretty good job of that, right? And they, yeah, they, it's impossible not to stereotype characters because we all, yeah, Melanie's the straight lace sort of, I guess, prude, you would say. She's totally creeped out by her boyfriend. <laughs> like Charlie's. Oh my god, that's way more cringe. The scenes with them, after she says his touch is starts is starting to feel like, you know, an uncle, a distant uncle putting his hand like after she said that, every interaction between the two of them, that's way more cringy to me than the 
the sex scene between um, Kylo Ren and and Hannah in that episode. Oh my God. Um, so, and, you know the this is this is kind of it's it's caught in between like third and fourth wave feminism. Um, it's not quite to the fourth wave, which is concerned, you know, primarily with intersectionality and empowerment. So it has that empowerment, but it's like someone mentioned in their comments. It's not too diverse. It's all white. It's four white girls. You know, um, yeah, that's that's almost a trite criticism, but it's certainly valid. Um, so it's not, it's about empowerment, not necessarily individualism, but still it's caught in between those two waves of feminism. Um, but again, I think it strips away the facade of the sex and the city feminism and gets to more interesting, um, interesting content and concepts as a result. So, um, your comments. Um, you know what? I'm going to give you the bonus word for today. The extra credit word. Yeah. Use the word feeble. Feeble. In your response to this post. And um, I'll love you forever. And you know, give you extra credit. Um, feeble is the Easter egg word right here in the middle. Anyway, your comments. Lizzie, um, I like that you made that connection between it's not just women. Like, no, putting women and men on the equal playing field in terms of both of their lives are shitty, right? So it wasn't like Adam, Kylo Ren, in this case, was, you know, this, like, fucking hedge fund manager. And he was, like, doing great and had this big apartment or whatever. And Lena and all the women are struggling. Now, Adam gets 800 bucks a month from his grandmother. And, you know, he has conflict. Yeah, he has complicated relationships with his parents and with his employers and with never be anyone's slave, like all of that kind of stuff. That in that apartment, someone's someone said I could I could smell that apartment just from watching it in class. It's like, oh man, that apartment has to stink. Um so yeah, like and then Ray, you know, Ray's kind of that that hipster cynic, right? talking about McDonald's and stuff, and he's $50,000 in debt. Charlie kind of has his shit together, but he's a simp, kind of like, yeah, simpy, um, cringy for reals. But the men are in the same boat, basically saying, like, we're not, there's, no, there's no gender here. It's like people... 20 somethings are fucked, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter what your gender is. Yeah, women might have some more struggles, but in this case, the men are basically on the same plane. Um, living equally shitty lives. I, I appreciated that, Lizzie. Um, Amanda, what did I write? How authentic do we want it? I don't know why I wrote that. Said Amanda. How authentic do we want it? Hannah falls apart. Oh, you were Amanda was saying basically that she didn't like, or it's not a great representation that Hannah completely is just like a fucking basket case in this first episode, right? She she resorts to drugs and has a complete breakdown and quits her job and just because her parents took the money away. And how authentic do you want it? Like, I think that's authentic. That 
her rea Hannah's reaction to everything, I think is authentic. But it's a poor, it's a, it is, it's a poor image or representation to put out there. So I see what you're saying, but I'm like, that, it's a valid response. Like I think a lot, I think what they were going for with the show was, again, let's show the, neg the, the negative sides of this stuff, right? So it's like, is Hannah's character empowering? I mean, not really from this episode, but it depends on how you look at it. Like, how authentic do we want it? Because I think if Hannah goes the other way with it and becomes this great success story and uses it to fuel herself, then we're getting, I don't want to say that's not realistic, but you're getting into the sugar coating of the, these situations, maybe. Um, but that's always going to be this, this uh, argument back and forth is like, you know, that's a bad representation of women that they completely fall apart when their parents take their money away. Is it bad or is it authentic? Because they can be the same, right? And vice versa. Um, it just made me think. Thank you for making me think about that, Amanda. Um, Sean, my reaction to your comment was the paradox of entitlement. Hannah's independence and confidence is completely unearned. Does that make sense? I don't even know if that makes sense. Sean said, she is being independent, writing her own book, confident she can be the voice of her generation. Right. It's, <laughs> being independent and being and confident is great, but not when it's completely unrealistic, right? Lena Dunham's character, Hannah, is clearly a product of this. Like, oh, you can be whatever you want to be. And she th literally thinks that she is the voice of her generation and that she just needs more time to do this book and all this stuff. Like, none of that is earned. There's nothing that would point to that being true other than the, the entitlement that she has been sort of raised uh, within, if that makes any sense. Um, I don't know. I think it makes sense. The paradox of entitlement, I called it. It's like you believe you can be anything, but you really can't. Or you believe that you're owed things, but you're not. Like that that kind of thing. It's like all of this independence and confidence that you know, Sean notes in his comment is like it's completely un unearned. There's nothing behind it. It's like this it, yeah, it's it's hollow confidence. Um I think that's dangerous. That's as dangerous as not being confident. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just like vibing here. Um, RB Dubs. Feminist, I wrote feminist sausage. And I, I think I talked about it in class. Um, on Monday. Like, this show is showing the sausage being made and sex in the city is the finished the fancies itself the the sausage itself does that make sense like this is feminism girls is feminism in action like this is the implications we talked about this with Roseanne too like the implications of choices and things like that that we make that are informed by our you know our feminist ideals and what happens as a result right 
they're doing the work of feminism within girls. They're that's they're showing the sausage being made. And Sex in the City starts after that process, it seems. And it's just like, hey, we all have sausage now. And I realize the unfortunate phallic nature of sausage in this scenario, so I apologize for that. Um, yeah, what did you say here, B? Um, yeah, in Sex and the City, we already see successful women. We don't know how they got there, right? I'd love to know how they got there. That, I think, is what girls is. It's like how w these women are getting where they're going, right? Um, and then that led me to my whole Lena Dunham taking back feminism thing. Um, so thank you for that, RB. Uh, Lena Dunham and girls is taking back feminism from the sort of the male, uh, the male grip, the, the grip that men had on it in terms of shaping it into, shaping it into a concept that could benefit them greatly. It's now taking, we're, women are taking back feminism and this is what it's going to be about. And it's girls. Surprise. Uh, finally, if Oz mentioned the men in the I, I talked about it just a few minutes ago but he mentioned the men in the class or in the in the show and how they're represented from a different perspective like every guy if you watched I mean most of you have only watched that one episode of Sex in the City but it's a running joke from for me and my wife when we watch Sex in the City every guy is like a hedge fund manager, a CEO. He ran a startup. He's he's a wealthy artist. Like every guy is this fucking superstar. And girls, it's far from it, right? They're just fucking like back to Lizzie's comment. They're just as shitty as the girls. Their plight is no different. Like not socially but economically and all those kinds of things so that is refreshing i think a lot i think it's refreshing i think girls is it's a palate cleanser for a culture that for a long time leading up to it had some seriously warped ideas of what feminism is so there you have it have a good weekend